Hello, welcome to Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit, the newest and most reliable state-of-the-art time-traveling transportation service, is now boarding. We are now departing present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, I want to welcome you all to this very special week. This week marks the release of the Ozymandias Project's 20th episode overall. But this is also the first episode released under our podcast's new official title, Ancient Office Hours. We made this change because we felt the new title will help our listeners understand what kind of conversations we try to have on our show. I can't wait for you all to hear this very special episode, because not only does this mark our milestone 20th episode, but also because my guest is someone I've wanted on the podcast ever since I began it in August 2020. So to celebrate, my guest this week is Dr. Kara Cooney, a professor of Egyptology at UCLA. Kara's scholarly work centers on coffin reuse, primarily in the 21st dynasty. You may recognize her as the host of the Discovery Channel documentary series, Out of Egypt, or as the author of The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, and When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt. She's wonderful, interesting, has a great sense of humor, and is someone you could talk to for hours and still have a million questions. I had so many questions that prioritizing what to ask was quite the challenge for me. We mainly discuss the exclusivity of Egyptology programs, using the ancient world to help us understand the modern world, and about Cleopatra and the aggrandizement of the failures of powerful women in the past and present. When I was little and dreamed of being an Egyptologist, I wanted to be just like her when I grew up. While that clearly didn't happen, it was an absolute honor and joy to be able to speak with her today. I know you'll love this episode, so I'll shut up now and let you get to it. There were a few minor audio issues. Sorry, guys. Our devices were being a little finicky, but nothing major. Enjoy, and I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is thanks for having me. Pleasure. So I want to just jump right in, and I'm not going to ask you the question that you probably get all the time, which is why do you love Egyptology? Because I don't <laughs> think there's a a more pointless question because that's asking me why do I love ancient Greece, and I couldn't tell you. But I will ask instead, how did you make the decision that you're going to go into this as a career? Because definitely, I think a lot of people just say, oh, I like this, but it's a completely different level to be like, no, I'm going to actually pursue this. Yeah, it's it was a long and complicated road. And I didn't realize as an undergraduate that I could actually do something like this until I started applying for um, the Marshall and Rhodes scholarships. So, you know, if you're like a super, I'm not type A, but I always apply for stuff. And I was, you know, really ambitious and trying to get whatever I could. And so I, I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for the Marshall scholarship, which was way more my jam than the roads because I wasn't very political then though. I seem to be getting more political by the day, but that's another discussion. But um, so during that process, you have to look at graduate programs in Britain and you have to say where you're going to study and with whom you're going to study. And it forced me to do research that I had not done yet and I did not know how to do. And then I found myself, and this is back in, oh my God, 1993, 90, yeah, probably 1993, where I'm in the library, um, the internet barely exists and you have to look up in books in the, in the uh, reference section of the library Yes, like these books that collect all of the programs in graduate study in higher education. And I started to look into those for the United States and for Britain. And I'm like, oh, I could study at Oxford. I could study at Cambridge. I could study at the University of Chicago. I could study at Johns Hopkins. And I just started. And then I'm like, OK, so I'll, I applied for the Marshall thing. And at the same time, I also applied to American programs. And it's, you know, I just learned by doing. And uh, but up to that point. I had actually transferred from the University of Notre Dame, um, Notre Dame, as they as they call it, um, where I felt very um, hampered and controlled by the Catholic patriarchy <laughs> to be a certain white thing. And I, I needed to get out of that. 
And I ended up going to the University of Texas at Austin, which I had grown up as a Houstonian thinking was the school of the bro and the sorority chick and really didn't want to have anything to do with, but ended up getting there and found it was a school of 50,000 souls and there was a place for me. And there was there were so many different things there. So I did ancient studies. I just knew I wanted to do anything old and dead. And they don't, they didn't have Egypt at the University of Texas at Austin. So I wasn't able to really engage in my passion. There would, a class would come up every now and then. And of course I would take it and freak out. But most of what I did was classical archeology, span lots of new world stuff, lots of paleoanthropology, interestingly. And, um, which has all changed. I was like the best in my undergraduate paleoanthropology class. I knew all the different scenes, you know, Australopithecine and all of all the different guys. And now you, it's all different. I look at it and go, this is a different language. I don't understand what's happened in the last 20 years, 30 years, that's scary. Um, but so it was through, um, to get back to your answer, it was through the application process of applying for graduate schools and then getting accepted to, um, I didn't get the Marshall, I was a finalist but did not get it, but then Oxford accepted me and, and, and had some possibilities for me to attend. And then Penn accepted me and Chicago accepted me. And then Hopkins accepted me, but gave me uh, a stipend in addition to full tuition. And then it became something, and this is back in the day when, you know, you could be accepted, but be accept, expected to pay part of your tuition, which does not happen as much in the humanities, except at lesser tiered schools. So if you're accepted to a Chicago or Penn or UCLA, it is with a package, you know, we don't accept you um, and expect you to pay. But but lots of those schools accepted me and expected me to pay. And I'm like, well, how does one do this? Um, and when I got the offer from Hopkins, I was like, huh, that's interesting. So I could get a little bit of money for doing this. And, um, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't research the different schools. I didn't research the professors who were there. I had no idea. And I just ended up at Hopkins and worked with Betsy Bryan. Richard Jasnow would join later. And, um, and it was great. You know, I, I, it took me eight years to get through. And um, I also, also, while I was there, I didn't think about the job market. I didn't really think about getting a job until I had to. I seemed to be very skilled at putting on blinders and not worrying about the thing I need to worry about until it's right there. And then I really worry about it. But I don't get in my own way in the process of worrying about it. I, that was a long answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very useful, though, because I mean, I I would have found that personally probably a really great approach for myself. Um, you know, worry about the problem when it's there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm like that overanalyzer, see 10 steps ahead problem. So I definitely did not think I'd be a classics major for sure not. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, I had an amazing teacher. And we were doing the ancient Egypt and Greece unit that year. And it was so special because it was very like interactive in a way that back then, what is this? It, well, to you, it probably does not seem very long ago, but I think I was, it was what, 2006, maybe? Oh gosh. Yeah. I'm revealing my age, but yeah. So she, like my teacher was amazing and, you know, everyone had to like choose an Egyptian name and you could build your own pyramids and have competitions and then she did this really cool thing where like she would stand at the front of the class read myths and then make students perform them for the classmates that's awesome so yeah definitely after that I came home to my mom and I said I'm gonna be an Egyptologist mom and she said I don't know what that is but I will support you sure how do you do that and I was like I, I don't know I'll check it out so you know I got really lucky and uh I got connected to some pretty smart people who could advise me and then when they basically just said okay well when you go into high school you got to start with this and then when you get to college you got to do this this and this I just said oh I'm not going to get a job with that that seems very hard also wait I have to learn like four other languages oh that's yeah. really hard uh yeah. so that I just was like no I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that which I didn't but you know, it worked out. I went into classics in college and uh, that's that's where I found my niche. But yeah, I mean, classics has a clear path. Classics is much easier because most schools have a classics department. You can do Greek, you can do Latin, you can do it for years. And then there's a clear path to the graduate study after. And it's just an easier ask. Egyptology, there are so few places that have these things offered. So you have to be a little bit mad to be able to find them. Same with the seriology. Yeah. Yeah, that's my general impression. I mean, but then there's also the fact that aren't most Egyptology programs at 
the top fanciest universities, mm-hmm. they don't really have them anywhere else either. Absolutely. And I think the UCs are an exception, though Berkeley is no, Berkeley and UCLA are now in there in those top 25s, right? And super hard to get into. And um, yeah, it's it's kind of ridiculous that, that it's like this. But there are other places, you know, there's always um, the Egyptology program, which is master's only at uh, University of Indiana, uh, University of Memphis, um, American University, Cairo. So there, there are other places, but you know, if you happen to live in Indiana, yeah, you can do Egyptology. So that exists, but it's not, it's not something that everyone gets access to. I mean, and access is just obviously one of like the biggest problems, I think, for most of the ancient fields anyway, just the languages mm-hmm. and then the weird requirements that you have to do. And then um, just kind of everything. If you want to go into academia, then they encourage you to do a bunch of other things that you're like, I can't pay for. Or how do I compete with like a billion other people to get this? You know, why do you think there's such a problem with this exclusivity, though? I mean, is it just like there's not enough people because we don't need enough people so and where they go they want to go to the big name schools with prestige or is it we could expand but we'd have to get more people and that's just not feasible with our current funding situation yeah there's there's egyptologists in many universities around the land but those egyptologists don't end up training exclusively in egyptology they'll be doing global history ancient studies from gilgamesh to the you know medieval period um I've taught those classes myself, actually. It's kind of crazy. But um, it is it is an extraordinarily exclusive club. And um, why that is, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's, it's an academic game. But why, you know, is Egyptology necessarily more exclusive than classics? I don't, I, let me put it this way. There are a lot of African studies departments throughout and African-American studies departments throughout the country that include Egypt in their studies, but it's more for students of color who feel excluded from white Egyptology. And so that's, that's very much um, something that I'm thinking about a lot, that it's not only exclusive in terms of its elitism and ivy, ivory towerism, but it's also exclusive in its whiteness. It's, um, it's as bad as classics, which is white ancient studies, if you want to call it that, it is. But it's um, what Egyptology is, is North African studies by white people. That's what Egyptology is. Whereas, and it's important to remember that there is a whole other stream of Egyptian Nilotic studies done by people of color who feel excluded from the traditional Egyptology. So uh, yeah, the answer to your question is a complicated one, but certainly one that interests me. Yeah. I mean, we definitely grapple with a lot of those same issues. Hi, we're adjacent. So I definitely understand that stuff. Um, Going back just a little bit then from this big sort of accessibility issue, uh, you specialize in coffins. And, you know, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your research and you know why is it coffins that interest you so much like I I know they're cool but a lot of other people don't I I didn't try to do the coffins here's what led me to it and it'll hopefully make sense I read the uh this book by Michael Baxendall called um experience and painting in 14th century Italy I think that's the title, but everyone can Google the Michael Baxendall. This is the second time I've mentioned this in a podcast. So I really should look the damn book up and get the title right. But um, it's all about how the artisan creates a contract. To, and in that contract, the materials are mentioned. It's mentioned how the artistic piece will be produced. And it's the economics of that artistic production and a negotiation between commissioner and artisan or commissioner and workshop. And I loved that. I loved looking at art as an economic process, as a commodification, um, that as a tool of power, as make sure you put in enough Egyptian blue, you know, make sure you put in enough ultramarine. I really need to show off to my friends. Um, That's very interesting to me because I grew up in a society in Houston, Texas, where material displays granted great social power. And I was always on the margins of those material displays and was the anthropologist cynically looking at, you know, in from the outside, um, judging uh, all of those um, popular people as they got their 
sorority pictures done and spent $10,000 on their portfolio to get into said sorority. You know, this is how I grew up. When Time Magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, wanted to do a piece on wealthy kids who got everything they wanted, they came to my high school. And so this was the world that I grew up in. This is a public high school in Texas, but this excess and display has always interested me. How do people do it? What do they get out of it? How does this work? How does it manufacture power? And so that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it for ancient Egypt. So I needed to get to economic origins and commissions. And the only way to do that is through with normal people who aren't the king. And you can't do it with the king. There's no text that says, okay, we're commissioning Tutankhamun's um, coffin set. We don't, we're not going to make it ourselves. We're going to reuse it. And we're going to use that one. And we're going to do it in this. You don't have those texts. It doesn't exist. Um, but we do have them for coffins. And so you, it's the coffins enable a social history unlike any other. So I'm not, I'm not interested in the coffin because of the death, though that has certainly added another extra dimension of interest. Um, the fact that the interior of this artistic object has a juicy center of, of flesh and bone certainly complicates and fetishizes what it is that I'm doing. But it... All I really wanted to do was ask, how do elites who are competing with each other commission this stuff, make decisions, compete with each other? What materials do they include? And the only way to do that was, and it was Betsy Bryan who handed me Yak Janssen's Commodity Prices in the Ramesid Period. See what you can find from these prices. She didn't say, look at the coffins. She just handed me that book. And I'm like, okay, start looking through there. And the only variability of that amount where you could see people, you know, some people could afford a lot, some a little, um, some pieces could be off the charts expensive, were coffins. Livestock also falls into that category, but you're not commissioning livestock, <laughs> right? You can have a bull that's super expensive or you can have a gelded ox that's less, or you can have uh, a cow that's, uh, if it's a good cow, then it could be a lot of money, but anyway. So um, the the coffins came from, from my, um, social uh interests and that's and and it hasn't stopped and the coffin so many people in at ucla too are like uh, they roll their eyes like oh more coffin studies so boring what are you even doing and i just go i'm sorry the coffin pres provides information on gender socioeconomic place name and title it gives you uh the spending ability it gives you religious knowledge information it gives you regional information it it gives you information about scarcity and when materials are available it gives you information about it reuse which is what i'm working on now crisis um there's it's the gift that keeps on giving and it's all individually encapsulated for specific people so you can actually use an object study to find an individual from an individual who wants to be found and so it's um it's it's just really really fun to try to find the ancient Egyptians, in the same way that Daryl Medina studies attracts people who want to know, you know, what it was like to, to try to get divorced, what it was like to be in, a, in an abusive relationship in the ancient world. You can't answer that anywhere else in Egypt except with Daryl Medina data. Um, and I would say that there are many questions you can only answer with, with Coffin's data. So that's why. I, yeah. get so I get so passionate about my coffin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, for other people who are very passionate about coffins or just want to learn more about coffin reuse, you know, uh, where are the best places to go study this, to learn from somebody or to even read something? I mean, for coffins? Uh, for, to learn? to So there's two places and they're both in California, which is really interesting. So if you're looking at coffin studies and you want to do Book of the Dead and you want to take a really religious approach, then I would go work with Rita Lucarelli at Berkeley. And it's funny that we have this like coffin studies world at the University of California, um, one to the North and one to the South. And then if you wanna take a more jaundiced um, social approach, then you would come to, to UCLA to work with me. And I'm, if I'm trying to list all the people who've done coffin studies with me, um, there's Carrie Arbuckle McLeod, who's at University of British Columbia now, um, has a postdoc there. Um, and she, she worked on a, her, a dissertation that was all about carpentry and coffins, of course, are a huge part of that dissertation on, on carpentry um, and the community of practice of the carpenter. Um, I'm also working with Vera Rondano, 
um, Italian uh, scholar who's come to us uh, for the last six years and she's working on late period coffins and is also has a, a social economic edge. She's looking at how coffins represent a kind of um, nascent middle class that you can use the late period coffins to show that society is being broadened, that more people are commissioning coffins than ever before and that you have a kind of a systematized modularity of coffin construction that so many need to be made that they're they're regularizing it in a way that they did not do in the Bronze Age or the early iron and that you see in the 25th and 26th dynasties. So she's using coffins and other things as well to prove a, a social shift, which is um, extraordinarily interesting. And then other people who've worked on on coffins, I'm trying to think of the graduate students who finished with me. Um, I hope I haven't left anybody out. I mean, right now there's Nick, Nick Brown, who's um, working on Valley of the Kings, um, rituals and kingly uh, accoutrement of death. And we work together on coffins all the time. He's, he's going to defend his prospectus in the coming month. So he's, he's got more work to do. But um, yeah, there's been, there's been lots of people interested in coffins, but they, they need to differentiate themselves from me so that they can be employable. Um, and, um, and yet, I, yeah, I, I'm now starting to draw postdocs, which is weird. So I have a Marie Curie fellow coming to work with me, supposed to be this year, but COVID interceded and she'll come next year. And um, I have another postdoc coming to study ancient economics. Um, that'll be interesting. So, you know, lots of, coffins can um can give extraordinary gifts so yes well i'll say so we have your very academic profile which is the coffin reuse mm -hmm. so i think for the people who are not so much on, tuned into the academic side they know you more from your author tv side so your more public facing persona you know can you talk a little bit about your most recent book just for those who may yeah, not know sure. about it yeah, so if, you, if you're not aware of this, I'm rather schizophrenic in the way that I've created my um, career. I'm Kathleen M. Cooney in the academic world, and I'm Kara Cooney, which is what everyone calls me, in my trade books and my TV work. I don't do as much TV work anymore. It's, um, it's a tricky business. I like to own my own copyright, and um, I think there's, there's more value of me as a public-facing intellectual by taking that tack. And I, I, there came a point where I'm like, where I produced my own TV show and it was an extraordinary amount of work. And, you know, there was money for a limited amount of time. And I'm like, and then they just use it and do whatever they want. And I don't see it again. I'm like, wow, I produced that. And it's just, and it's theirs. And that's just it. Um, so I wanted to own what I produce. And I made a specific decision to um, own that copyright. And I was approached by a lit agent who's like, you should write a public facing book and, and said, you know, why don't you, I remember he, he uh, we were sitting in the faculty center at UCLA and he's like, you should write a book about Hatshepsut. And I said, I can't write a book about Hatshepsut. And he said, why ever not? And I said, because she's 18th dynasty and I do the 19th and 20th dynasties. And he rolled his eyes and said, why would you not want, want to write a book about female power in ancient Egypt? And I went, when you put it that way. Um, and so that kind of planted the idea in my mind. And I, it's kind of funny because Hatshepsut just keeps, I don't know, haunting me, like, tell my story, tell my story. And I keep saying, man, you know, I don't know if I'm the right person. No, you are. And so this, the circumstances find a way for me to tell Hatshepsut's story. So my first trade book, was the woman who would be king. And it's a, though I didn't realize it at the time, a ballsy, mad experiment in trying to follow some, a person's decision-making in a shielded authoritarian society from cradle to grave and a little bit after. So it's like trying to find the politics of an ancient place that shields its own politics. And I learned a lot in that process. It was an incredible experiment to engage in that kind of hypothesizing and trying to figure out how the ancient world, particularly ancient Egypt works. And I'm super glad that I've done it, but I think um, it upset a lot of Egyptologists. 
um, which we, we can talk about later or not, whatever. But the, the next book that I did, um, trade book, was, is called When Women Ruled the World. And it's, I think the subtitle is Six Queens of Ancient Egypt. And then five of those became female king. And it's a discussion of power and uh, really found its origins in a class that I teach at UCLA called Women in Power in the Ancient World, in which I compare Egypt to Greece and Rome and China and India and Mesopotamia and the Levant and, um, and try to understand what these patterns are. And it ends up becoming a study of the patriarchy, the water in which we swim, I like to say, um, but through the lens of those extraordinary and rare females who were able to become nothing less than king. So that was um, really fun to write. And I was able to write it pretty quickly because I've been thinking on these topics for so long. And um, the book that I'm writing right now that I've just finished the, the last edit for, and it'll go to proofs, um, is called The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World, which will piss off a lot of Egyptologists <laughs> and others because it is very much about the patriarchy and how we still want a king and we still uh, look up to these God Kings and value them for their fatherly authoritarianism and ability to tell us what the right way is um, or the ability of elites to shield, to ideologically shield their own um, entitlements and powers. Um, so I, I just, you know, no one is safe, including myself in this next book. <laughs> so um, that's, that's a, in a nutshell, my trade book publications. Um, yeah. So with this expansion into some of these uh, gender dynamics, gender and power, and uh, especially f with the focus on the ladies, um, who, yes, I, I was very happy that you chose to write about them because I, I knew about them, but obviously that's because I do weird deep dives into uh, Egyptology and I consider myself a an armchair literary Egyptologist, you know, sometimes just because. It's awesome. Uh, so I found it very interesting because I think you said in a couple different podcasts or something somewhere that you understand our modern world, especially the modern political landscape, much better through the lens of the ancient mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And after graduating, I started my professional career and I went right into politics. So I'm kind of a walking cliche over here. Um, That's awesome. But can you explain, if it's possible, a little about how does it actually help you to understand what's going on now? Because these are really crazy times and I have so many friends who just are freaking out. And I understand where you're coming from, because honestly, studying ancient political thought and the ancient Greeks, that absolutely influenced me going into politics because I was like, I know things from the past. I know what worked, what didn't. This helps me. Let me work through this because I'm, you know, it's something that I say that I know is the truth that I use the lens of the ancient world to see the modern world around me better. Why that is and how that actually functions. Like, you know, we, when you teach a student how to write and you're like, make a flow chart, you know, this can be your thesis, you know, how does it actually work? How does it actually function? Um, what's the mechanism? That's a little harder for me to get at, but essentially the main thrust of it, I think is that, it's helpful for me to, if, if we all are American exceptionalists or um, there's masculine exceptionality, you know, that we, we have all these um, exceptionalisms, um, make America great again or, or whatever, and, and we think of ourselves as better. Um, I think we have an extraordinary modernist exceptionalism that we in the modern world are somehow superior of mind, different of genetics. Um, not like those ancient primitive people who believed in mythologies and, and uh, you, we, we just think ourselves better. When you study the ancient world, however, it's, um, you realize we are them and they are us. It's exactly the same systems, but because the ancient world is, doesn't have as much noise, because we have to piece it together and because ancient texts often demand a much more overt expression of how power is manufactured and maintained, it's easier to see. And our power can be so ideologically obfuscated or 
you take the thousands of years difference and you can, we can more easily see how an ideology of Osiris and Horus is used to obfuscate and veil a, a political um, power grab. Because we don't believe in Osiris and Horus, it's easier for us to identify. Today, if you are an evangelical Christian, it's very hard for you to, to separate the politics from the ideology because the ideology is veiling what the reality actually is. And I think there are many of us who are like, but I'm not an evangelical Christian, I don't do that. But the ideology of patriotism, of totemism of a flag, of the saying the national anthem, you know, all of these ideologies, I think um, they're so embedded in our culture that we don't see them as ideologies. We see them as morality, as what is right and good. And it's super helpful to have distance, to look at the world, the human world through a glass case, like in a museum with distance, like, um, you know, when, when you've gone through a really difficult relationship that involves abuse and you're embedded in that abuse, you can't see it until you're out of that relationship. And then you look back and you're like, oh my God, I was a pawn and I did this and I was exploited. But in the context of it, you can't see it. And it's the same with, with any political aspect in the world, which is why I link the two. This also makes people very upset. And I find it so interesting that it makes people so upset. And I've been accused of being a universalist, um, which I suppose means that I'm not, uh, uh, I'm racistly, whitely imposing my um, modernist uh, reactions and entitlements onto ancient Egypt. And I should not be doing this because it's, you know, my, I, I, it's just inappropriate and they're two different worlds and you have to take each one in their own particularist way. And, while I understand that those are valid criticisms and I, I do take those criticisms on board and try to be mindful of them, I think that we can go too much, we can hide behind particularism and we can fetishize the ancient world. We can say, you can only look at Greece or Rome through their own particularist contextual um, perspectives. You can't compare them, we say. We can't say that it's anything like the, the modern world. No, no, you can't even equate them at all. They're, they're like apples and oranges, can't even talk about it. And that I do reject. And I reject that quite vehemently. And I reject that, I think that this pandemic has helped us to reject it, no. <laughs> I mean, this is a super happy light pandemic compared to anything that we've seen from the ancient world with cholera or, oh, I've been told cholera doesn't exist in the ancient world until it's not an ancient thing. So it, with all kinds of intestinal scourges, we'll leave it there, um, or maybe smallpox or other things, you know, being an ancient person and dealing with a pandemic, like the plague, bubonic plague, oh my God, um, oh my gods, you know, it could, it can take out a quarter of a village within it, within a couple months. And this is a tiny little plague, tiny little sort of, you know, one in 500 people die maybe in the United States by the end of it. Um, it's a lot. It's an extraordinary large number of people given our population, but most of us may know somebody who have died, but most of us who are in privileged places aren't super affected by it. But so, but my point is, is even with our modernist exceptionalism, even with all of our scientific ability and we can go to the moon, all of this stuff, we are such basic human animals who can't get their shit together enough to deal with the pandemic, to put on a goddamn mask and figure it out. And if we can't see that we're just human animals and we're the same as we were back then, with the same systems that are just bigger than we can even deal with, then I don't know what to say. So I think that the two must be compared. And I think that um, as soon as we think that we're different from ancient people, I go, wait, 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 why do you think you're better? You think you don't have a king? Oh, really? Who do we think Bezos is? And how do you think this works? How do you think, you know, what, what is kingship? How should we define it? Romans didn't think they had a king either, but they just called it, you know, Caesar Augustus and gave it a different name, but they had a king. We are doing exactly the same thing. And I just like to mess with people that way. It's, and I like to mess with my own brain that way and see it in a different way. So, yes.
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. Are you kidding? Uh, you know, in a in a little while here, I'm about to head off to Greece to go to grad school because I'm going to be studying modern Greek nationalism, which is wow. so fun because I connect yeah. that, right? I mean, yeah. I see how nationalistic they are in the ancient world. And then it just, it's funny because it's a circuitous sort of way where when people say, well, why do you want to study Greek nationalism? And I go, well, the Greeks are something I know. So I'd like to see the development from the ancient mm. to the modern and see how that went. And then Americans, we connect ourselves, right, through this, like, legacy of whiteness, and we need to save the classical world, but only because it's, like, our white supremacist ideal civilization. That's why we connect to that. So in a way, you know, I tell people, well, if I study Greek nationalism, then I'll understand where Americans kind of where we get that from, like, is ours kind of descended from theirs. So I understand definitely wanting to see from the lens of a different culture, which is why I think it's like the coolest thing ever. Yay. Um, (laughs) But you're not embedded. You're not embedded in Greek nationalism. So you have a distance. It gives you that Buddhist um, detachment that you wouldn't have otherwise. And so you can bring that detachment into this study and watch all the Greeks going absolutely crazy over a particular issue. And you're like, oh, wow, everyone's really going crazy over this. And you have the detachment to be able to look at that. That's what ancient studies affords. Um, Though we often do drink the Kool-Aid and become the cheerleaders for our ancient peoples and are unable to criticize or see um, any sorts of negativity, even within their rulers. But that's a different. Yeah, I mean, in I the totally... book that I just wrote, I had a section. Sorry, I'm inter- I'll oh, let you talk in a minute. In the book, <laughs> in the book I just wrote, I have a section where we become apologists for our colonizers, and I have a section on elite British education that prioritizes classics and the Romans who invaded them and screwed everything up and just took their lands and their peoples and all of this stuff. But you look at British elite education, and it is all Roman entitlements and and make Rome great again. And that's an extraordinary thing. A couple thousand years is not that long. And that's the other thing that Egyptology affords me is that long durée thought to see that this country of 250 years, whatever, slavery being 400 years in the past, whatever. I mean, the, all of those conditions still exist in the world today. It's such a short span of time and you need that historian's lens to see that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that really shaped kind of where I wanted to go. When I was in college, I studied abroad at the University of Edinburgh, and I fell in love with Scotland and Scottish culture and all of that stuff. And I said, I want to come study Scottish nationalism. This is so interesting, because there's very much like a constitutional nationalism, right? Not so much ethnic. Uh, But then I was like, this is hard, because I want to go deep colonization, super deep colonization that can't be seen where the king king and queen queen in this case so identifies with scottish culture that it's hard to disentangle what is english and what is scottish that that colonialism goes very very deep and it's only 300 years old yeah so i mean you know for, i i guess maybe that's me being a little choosy there but i was like this isn't ancient enough the greek stuff that's more ancient so i'll stick with that but it's interesting so you brought up you know the we don't seem to connect through just because of the sheer length of time that we are these ancient people, just the technology is a little different and stuff. So a question that I always ponder that I would love to to get your thoughts on is, do you sometimes think we are, are we actually more technologically advanced now um, than we were back then? Because I, I usually argue with people and say, well, I think that we aren't more technologically advanced. Like, I think it's just different, right? Because they could build the pyramids and all these other ancient structures. Mm. We don't know shit about how to build that now. Yeah. You know, you could say, well, we think we know, but I'm like, we don't. And so we can't recreate what these people have done, you know, even though we have modern technology. You know, I hadn't thought about it like that. And I love that take. That's really great that there's um, a hands-on craftsmanship that we have lost. And there's so much that one of the reasons that all of this History Channel and that Geo stuff exists out there is because we want to go back and learn these secrets that, that we have lost, this, these abilities to craft and, um, and create wonders without cranes and other um, types of technology. I, I think that's awesome. Um, so, I think I, you know, it just depends on what kind of technology you're talking about. I agree. Um, For, for example, right now, millennials, and I don't know about um, 
Gen Z, but um, astrology is all the rage, right? Everyone's all into astrology and it's, it's like super, it's just interesting. And I think it's a vacuum that's being filled by the lack of interest in the traditional patriarchal religions and, and trying to fill that vacuum with some other ideology, some other way of finding comfort in the world. But if you're going to look at the science of astrology and what the ancient people were actually able to do with it compared to what we do today and how people, if you get into, and I, I dabble in looking at astrology today because it's people connecting with the ancient world in a very real world kind of sense, trying to game their lives in a, in a way. I love that these people are always looking to the past, trying to discover the secrets that the ancients had. It's a similar kind of thing. And so much of it was lost because Christians burned it or it was considered demonic. It was considered highly problematic. It was a way of giving, um, it was a way of uh, sub, um, subverting power that the church wanted to have, whatever that, that church was. But so I think a lot of people would agree with you on that on that point. So yeah, we can go to the moon, but, um, but do we understand as human communities, how the moon moves, what it means when the moon is in a certain place in the sky, what it means for seasons and farming and movements of, of, um, animals, you know, how much do I was talking to somebody super cynical scientific type person who's like, because, you know, I, I do get obsessed with people who are interested in astrology and this subculture. It's very interesting to me. And he goes, oh my God, so you're telling me a bunch of bodies in the, in the sky have control over my life. And I said, well, yeah, there's a body in the sky called the moon that has control over my period every month. So yes, that body in the sky has control over the waves. I think there's a lot that we close ourselves off to because we see it as quote unquote primitive. And yet, how miraculous is that? It, that my period <laughs> is based on a lunar, that's, that blows my mind, really. When you really think about it, you're like, there is a rock out there that was once a part of the earth that it was blown off of it that goes around our rock and that determines when I then release the eggs, release the kraken, you know, that this is like a, a thing. And so I just, I was like, yeah, there's a rock called the moon and it affects me and cool, but yeah. And, and my, and I, you know, you don't believe in these things It's stupid and how primitive my son was born on a full moon in the sign of Taurus. And one can be like, oh my God, that's so stupid. And then you meet my son who is the most ADD, energetic, insane child in a beautiful way that you'll ever meet. And so I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of thinking this moon is more than I thought. And then you talk to people who work in emergency rooms. They're like, oh my God, the full moon days, help and save me from the full moon days when all the crazy people come into the emergency room and shit goes down. That These things are interesting to me. And I, I do wonder what there is that we don't even allow ourselves to examine and look at because we think it's quote unquote unscientific. And the ancients had no problem with that. They didn't separate medicine from magic. They didn't separate the natural world from the intellectual world. And we do these things. And I think that the ancients allow us to add more holistic understanding to our worlds. And I think that's why they're so attractive. I love that question. I think that's great. You know, I, I definitely don't, I did not come up with that on my own, but several years ago, I think I was like a freshman in college at this point, And somebody was just kind of like staring out at the sky. And I was like, Penny for your thoughts, man. Uh, and this person was just like, Oh, I was, I was just thinking these people who build monumental architecture, like the Parthenon, cause we were, we just got out of this class in the Parthenon and I go, okay, yeah, it's the coolest building ever. Like they built it and it's amazing. Have you seen the architecture on that thing? And she was like, well, I don't know. I wish I knew how to build that, but I have an iPhone. So we're technically yeah. better. Right. And I'm like, no, teach me how to build the Parthenon. Fuck. I'll throw my iPhone in, yeah. the, in the river, you know? So then, yeah, that just started like a whole line of thought that now I've, I've been pondering for many yeah. years. And I try to ask everyone, I come into contact with, Hey, do you know, are we more technologically advanced now than blah, blah, blah. So, uh, that's a really fun one, but just in terms of to, j just to cap off this nice conversation about, you know, your current work and, and gender and power in the ancient world, what is it about? Cause we have so many great female leaders now in the world and, and just 
from studying in Scotland, I was there during like these the golden years of Nicola Sturgeon's rise as first minister in Scotland. Love her so much. And then from afar, I've been able to see the rise of amazing women like Jacinda Ardern, who I just I watch every video she's ever released. I follow her on social media and just kind of fans awesome. out on her. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting now because I, I don't know how closely you, you follow or pay attention, but are you aware of like the weird tiff between Nicola Sturgeon and former first minister Alex Salmon that's going on right now? Mm-mm, mm-mm. No, so, tell me, teach me. Y- yeah, so Alex Salmon, the former PM, who was like her mentor, she gave this glowing speech throughout her rise to the head of the SNP, Scottish National Party, about how like important he was. And then there were some allegations that he's like harassed people and been like a shitty human being. And then he's accusing Nicola Sturgeon now of like, oh, you turned your back on me, you betrayed me, you deliberately like hid your knowledge to like save your own skin. And now you're just trying to make it look like I'm I did everything bad you know you share the blame so why are you not taking the blame and she's over here like I don't know Uh, there may have been an email but I didn't read it so it's turned into a shit show of course because it's politics yeah but it's interesting because Nicola Sturgeon has led probably the greatest expansion era of Scottish National Party politics and she's led the momentum for Scottish independence and it's interesting they did a poll the other day of who do you believe more and what's happening it's honestly mind-boggling that half the Scottish population still is going to choose Alex Salmon and say, oh no, Nicola Sturgeon's lying. She's terrible. We got to get rid of her now. And like, it just boggles my mind. I'm like, but he's clearly a shitty human being. So he's literally just trying to share the blame now. And you really, you're going to pick him over her. She's, she's done Mm -hmm. nothing but good things. And I think in the latest poll, they just said that in the upcoming elections, it's now projected that Nicola Sturgeon single-handedly is going to lose the outright majority in parliament, in wow. the devolved government. And I'm like, why are we so hostile to her? Because she's, to me, the same kind of compassionate leader that a Jacinda Ardern is, and she's doing so well, and she just won the greatest majority in the New Zealand parliament in, like, the past 50 years. So yeah. what is it about powerful women where one country will be like oh yes she's good this is good she handled the pandemic well she's done blah 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 we like her let's put her more in power versus same kind of person but the minute you know some former powerful man comes in and it's like oh no she's she she's tearing it all down we're gonna lose everything Mm -hmm. yeah this is complicated first they're both named after fish which is really weird so it's salmon versus sturgeon sturgeon's older but yeah, salmon's tastier. I don't know. I'm not a um, caviar fan, but anyway, um, so I, I don't know about all of that. It's very interesting, but thinking about the patterns of it, the hostility towards the female in power, in my opinion, happens because women must place themselves in the context of a larger patriarchy and play by the patriarchy's rules, and they will they are set up to fail within that context, and. I think this goes, you know, this is, this is, we're on, we're in a shift. We're in shifting landscapes right now. And it's not easy to see, but everyone's freaking out, right? Um, Generationally, everyone's freaking out. Um, People are getting sick all over the world. People are seeing that their societies are sick. Um, People are questioning what is even male versus female. And if that's even, those are two categories that we should embrace, or is it much more complicated than that? Um, the people who want to maintain the patriarchy are like, no, there are two and it, that's it. And there's no more complication than that. And everyone else is like, no, we're all queer. And it's super complicated. Um, but the, I, it wasn't until I finished my book, When Women Ruled the World, that I realized I had to write the whole damn thing to understand that all of these women, obviously they were all working within the context of the patriarchy whatever, however we understand that. That is the water in which we swim still. What does that do to create a um, woman as a placeholder who's used in the moment, but then discarded after her utility is over? How does that create the idea of a duplicitousness, our knee-jerk reaction that women are not to be trusted, that they are lying to us, Um, that, you know, Hillary Clinton's emails will attract more attention than the tens of thousands of Donald Trump lies. That is the truth. 
and that can be empirically proven. Um, that hostility and the, or the, well, let's go to the duplicitousness. I think that because women within a patriarchy so often are relegated to working through male systems and men themselves, like Hillary Clinton working through Bill. It was, it was one of the only mechanisms she had for a long time. Um, that using another human being to get your message out, to make your voice heard um, is considered less straight ahead. It is less straight ahead. It is one step removed. It is having to manipulate another human being to get your agenda performed. This is much easier to see in the ancient world, obviously, um, particularly Greece and Rome where women regularly had to use men to get their agenda performed in some way. That manipulation is necessary within the patriarchy. And that manipulation is still necessary because we still live within a patriarchy and Sturgeon had to use salmon <laughs> to get whatever, she, whatever power she had, she had to use him in, within the patriarchal system to get it, as I understand it, and I don't know this whole system. But then the backlash that, that could be created by that man saying, you just used and abused me, look what you've done. Um, it still works. It's still a, a, a system of great power. And it's ideology of using morality to fatherly morality. I'm gonna keep you safe morality. I know best morality. This is what my new book is about. Um, that ideology is very powerful and it brings in as many women as men. Um, I would argue, particularly generationally, or but so many young women who don't see, we can't see the water in which we swim. It is not something that is easily recognizable. And I can't tell you how many times I have taught the class, Women in Power in the Ancient World, and how many times I get pushback from young females saying, this is not the water in which I swim. You may, because you're old, but not me, oh no. And then the women of color in the class speak up and say, uh-uh, girlfriend, this is indeed the water in which we swim. Then bring in all of the people who are non-binary. They will then start to say, this is indeed the water in which we swim. And there's a whole discussion of how you perceive the water <laughs> and what the system actually is. So I'm giving you a very abstract answer to your question, but the answer is until we blow up the patriarchy, and that is indeed where I see human society going, and that is men's rights movement and the cancel culture and the pushback against cancel culture and all of these things. And, and, and what is sexuality and gender and who gets to identify as what? And do we even need to get married? And what does all of this mean? Um, as we move through these things, um, the systems themselves will all have to change in their microcosms and elementally. We're doing it on the household level first which is so interesting, but that doesn't move very quickly into laws, government, um, courts, and, and how things, just to give an example, in my own personal situation, having been through a divorce, in that old relationship that I was in, I was the breadwinner. He didn't have a job. And when we went divorced, he had zero and I had money. And I ended up having to pay child support because the laws were set up in a patriarchal way for the male breadwinner. So I went through this process, um, even though this was highly unfair to me, um, doesn't matter because it was set up for the stay at home mom. I went through the process as kind of a, I, I ended up becoming the male in the situation and he was then the stay at home mom. So laws like that, you know, need to be changed for the female who's the breadwinner in the family. Um, that's happening more now than not. So the, my point is, is that my reality in my domestic life did not re reflect the reality that the courts were judging my domestic situation by. And those laws need to be changed, but those laws only change when people start to see, oh wait, the domestic situation is like this or that. It ha we already have to change that. And now common law marriage is a thing for people with children because so many people aren't getting married. Um, which is, I think, a beautiful and wonderful thing. Marriage is bullshit. Um, I am married again, but that's because my um, the second guy is awesome, and he it was re it's really important to him. But and that's fine. So you know, it's it's um, you know, in that uh, way, marriage is great. But marriage as an institution is one of the most horrific things. <laughs> it's it's just awful. Um, but yes. 
Yeah, I and I know you've talked about and you've written about how we love to aggrandize the failure of women because I, mm-hmm. you know as a woman in politics you see this all the time and you don't even have to be mm-hmm. like some powerful world leader you could be any woman at any level and if you fail which you know i've worked on a couple of campaigns since graduating and let me tell you when something goes wrong who's the first to you know yeah. see the cold slap of why did you fail yeah. you know that's beside the point but is there a modern woman today who you see who you would consider maybe closest to breaking that pattern of, of having yeah. her eventual failures uh, aggrandized. I mean, you know, I would, I would have said Angela Merkel and then, you know, 2015 migration crisis happened and now everyone likes to blame Angela Merkel for, Oh, you let them in. So now it's your fault. And you're going to have a, a, a rough time when we look at your legacy. So, you know, that was to me closest. Oh yeah. These things are going to continue to happen. So um, what, what I see, I, I see the women being blamed for things. Yes. But I also see something new happen where a woman can disconnect from patriarchal manipulations or the demand for using the patriarchy to manipulate to a certain extent um, and gain more power through it. But let's take the example of Kamala Harris. Um, who obviously used the patriarchy and the criminal justice system to be meaner than mean, right? To show how tough that she could be and is now having to, and that's one of the reasons the hard left doesn't like Kamala Harris, right? Because she comes from this criminal justice system and is like, you know, she put all these people in jail. She's the bad person. What are you even doing? And now has to step up. And it's an interesting thing. Say, yes, I was wrong then. This is the way that the context and society was working, but this is not the way things need to continue to go. Um, and we need to rejigger everything. It's, um, but, but she also doesn't have to disassociate herself. She has to disassociate herself from the entire criminal justice system, but a lot of people have to do that now. And society as a whole has to do that now. And we're now seeing it as the, the racism that, that it is. Um, so that, that kind of discussion is happening as a whole. But for, it's, it's interesting to see the women who are disconnected um, don't have children that seem to have an easier time in politics because I think within the patriarchy, the water in which we swim, a woman with children is more distrusted because people assume she will give all of her resources to those children, that she's going to push everything in that direction, that she's only in it for them, that she has that other agenda. They don't think the same thing for a man with children, but they think a woman who has children will be clouded by that social uh, agenda and interest. And Kamala Harris without children doesn't have that, um, that additional albatross around her neck. I think it's horrible that a woman has to, you know, that we have to uh, um, nunify ourselves, vestal virgin ourselves, right, to gain power, but it, it is, you know, it's something that happened in the ancient world all the time and is still happening today. Um, it's interesting to see her able to surmount those takedowns easier than Hillary, um, whose age, connection to Bill, connection to Chelsea, I think, and Chelsea's connection to other people, right? That's where it goes. Like, look at what she's, what Chelsea's doing and what society she's in and she's friends with, um, with the Trumps, you know, or whatever. Um, that, that's where things can get. I think way complicated, um, just, yeah, but, but they're, they're all ready to take the next fall. So, um, what's, I guess, most refreshing is that there are a lot of men who are taking falls too, and being removed, um, when things are found out about them, like Harvey Weinstein or, um, Gary Erton, the professor at Harvard, but yeah, there, there could be more of these, the, the, yeah, this is a good discussion. I don't think we know the answer to your question yet because it, the water in which we swim is changing a little bit. Um, and I always say, I think we're moving out of the patriarchy. We're constructing it, we're figuring out a way. The patriarchy's fight back is like the, the extraordinary bombing right before the armistice is signed. And that patriarchy is trying to cut down every forest and drill every hole for every petrochemical. So the question is, do we destroy the earth first before we can get through this shift, this next age shift of the Anthropocene? What does this, this mean? Yeah, I mean, 
and and when you're dealing with like contemporary stuff obviously unlike the ancient stuff where we do have our answer we can just read about what yeah. happened yeah. uh you know it it's so much more volatile i mean when jacinda ardern became the first sitting prime minister i think in the world to have a child while in office mm-hmm. she was like celebrated down there and people were like this mm-hmm. is amazing we mm-hmm. love this and i was like you would never get that reaction here mm-hmm. Um, no. it's just not possible. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering like, maybe she'll break the mold and she'll escape her whatever terms and, and she'll have a great glowing reputation and be mm-hmm. known as one of the best world leaders, you know, or we could be waiting for something is going to go wrong in New Zealand in 20 years and she's going to be blamed for it. So we can't answer that, but it's something I'm constantly thinking about, but another famous or woman judged who, by her child, you know, her child yeah. is young. infants are beautiful and sweet seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds with learning differences are not. And, and when you, and, and being a mother of a child with such learning differences, it's extraordinary to see how people are like, well, have you tried this? And I'm like, look, bitch. Yeah. But it's, um, it's interesting that you can be judged. Um, a woman is judged based on the outcome of that child. Um, a man is too, but not given the responsibility for, for what are perceived um, difficulties. A woman, you know, she's a bad mama. It's her fault if the child doesn't turn out right. Tricky. Yeah. And, you know, that's a that's a tricky one because uh, I grew up with ADD off the wall and I had learning disabilities growing up too. You know, why someone my parents were like, why are you always failing math? Why are you just not good at it? Like, I don't understand this. It's like pretty simple stuff. And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just stupid. I don't know. That's why yeah. we say learning differences because the ADD mind It can be a very focused mind. It's just focused on, it's focused in a different way, focused on other things. I also think that a lot of this is environmentally driven. And if we didn't live in a land surrounded by Cheetos and high fructose corn syrup, I think that we, you know, our epigenetics and our um, brains would work in a different way. I think this is another reason we can look to the ancient world as being far superior to us um, in in many ways, because they didn't, they didn't ruin their their brains with all of this toxicity uh, led aside, I suppose, you know, everything can be industrialized and Rome is always a great example for those things. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of another famous woman in history, whose failure has really been aggrandized is uh, our girl Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. I I love analyzing how it gets translated into the popular culture and all that. And um, I know one of the most talked about, representations of her is in the new assassin well not new but the assassin's creed origins game where i think you know her first line when you meet her is i will offer to sleep with anyone if i can kill them in the morning and i'm like why why are we doing that you know so then it obviously comes down to okay well how are we portraying women what is our opinion of them to be portrayed on tv film and video games and it's just it's like mind-boggling how we don't I don't know. Is there a way where we're ever going to be able to do them justice in portrayals? Like, but that, you know, that could be a meta question to anything in the ancient world. You know, why, why every movie, why is every movie set in Egypt suddenly showing ancient Egypt in ruin? It definitely wouldn't have been in ruin if it's set back then, but we should, but we show it that way anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Cleopatra is, um, well, th- Okay, so in answer to your question, why do we in the media always show the ancient world this way, um, particularly Egypt? And I think that we're looking at it through the Roman lens and we're looking at it through that competitive Roman lens where um, a woman like Cleopatra is an excellent foil to keep Mark Antony as the good Roman general who was just seduced by this witch um, who changed him. And you, it, it's, um, it's a useful way of not having to take down one of your heroes, popular heroes. Um, but we still do the same, right? So we, we look through everything, so much of Egypt, if we can, through a Greco-Roman lens. We look through it through a Herodotian lens, um, everything with Cleopatra through a Roman lens. And you know that for my last chapter, I'm like, okay, I'm throwing out the Roman. I'm not gonna include it and I'm not going to do a Stacey Schiff and cite every little Roman thing and try to get into her mind. I can't. Um, I'm just going to try to treat her as I treat all of these other women with the limited Egyptian evidence that we have. And then let's see what we can, what we can do with this. And, you know, I end up coming to the conclusion that I don't think she committed suicide. I think that's a bullshit ideology. 
I think that a murder obfuscated as suicide is, is very useful to Octavian. And um, that, that's my opinion. I also then see, and I, and I didn't get to push this in the book as far as I would like, because Nat Geo was like, mm -mm. but Cleopatra is a martyr, is a martyr like Jesus. And her ISIS cult spreads throughout the Mediterranean in a very similar way until the Christians win and it is quashed. But I would argue that the Christian inclusion of Mary, mother of Jesus as this virgin um, mother is very much in reaction to an ISIS cult, the power of the ISIS cult. That was like one of their main mystery cults to take on and to pull people from. And, and I think more could be done with uh, Christianity versus ISIS cults. Um, and seeing Cleopatra as a kind of Jesus uh, in the ancient world. So um, yeah, she's fighting against the man. She's fighting against the system. She's fighting against the empire. She is a freedom fighter in, in some ways. Certainly Zenobia's generation saw her in that way and connected to her in that way. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, we, one could could do even more with Cleopatra studies from from that um, anti-imperial perspective, but also through the ideological lens. Um, yeah, makes Apuleius read a whole lot differently. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but you know, that's just Cleo. We just you know we take her in popular culture and just you know put her through the shredder there. But yeah. I mean, I think it goes to the the wider issue, and and that's something that I actively spend so many of my waking hours on, which is how do we get media and academics to talk to each other right i think that we're ready in a way for more accurate portrayals more true to life things which people are still very resistant to and mm -hmm. i don't really know why so mm -hmm. it's so wonderful when you see the collaboration but these are two industries that just sort of hate talking to the to each other um yeah i <laughs> Like, I don't know, is there, is there, as someone who's done TV stuff, yeah. do you see avenues for greater collaboration? Like, is this something we should be doing? Yeah, I mean, I made my own TV show. I, you know, it was, it was called Out of Egypt. You can watch it for free on YouTube. And I had to watch a part of one the other day. And I was like, oh, my God, this is kind of interesting. It holds up. It's, um, it's some crazy musings about religion and violence, why there are pyramids all over the world. Um, what the, the devil is and where it came from and looking at the devil from, you know, all kinds of different perspectives. Um, so, you know, and, and I had to fight with executives every day. No, this is how we're going to do it. No, I don't want to wear that. No, this is how, you know, why are you always pairing me with the shortest person <laughs> for me to interview? Can we sit down? But that's a different thing. Um, but um, so, you know, that's a nonfiction TV reality. I think that what is coming for the nonfiction TV reality is very exciting. And um, we were talking about this just recently on an, uh, a panel that I did with uh, Interconnections of Egypt. I don't know if, and Chris Naughton, um, Yasmin Shazli and um, Fatima Rezik were all on this panel. And um, we were talking about uh, how, how we need to work more well, well I, I was saying, look, Nat Geo, History Channel, and um, Discovery, are they're not going to last. What's going to happen is streaming. And streaming doesn't need as much money, and it doesn't need as many eyeballs. So you don't need to have a million people watching your show to get your show made. And so anybody who's out there with the ability to edit and the ability to produce content, people are producing content and streaming it themselves on YouTube and getting massive followings. And we're, it's happening. So that kind of thing is happening as we speak. What's not happening as much as one would like, but I'm certainly making um, inroads into well, some people I think are, but I am too. And I can't really talk about it, but um, is to work with the larger nonfiction television and film world. Film, I can, it's just, it's such big numbers and so much stress. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Anything you give them, it goes into the sausage machine of the executives and it comes out in a completely different way unless you're like JK Rowling and then look what it did to JK. But anyway, um, I think that TV series is where it's at for fiction. And, um, and I have some, I have some ideas. So my, my book, When Women Rule the World has been optioned for a fictional thing. And then I have another iron in the fire. So um, 
let's see if we can get people with academic backgrounds and abilities to be on the cutting edge of making content. Um, it can happen and it is happening. Um, it just takes a while. The, these, these developments and, and um, production and all of this stuff, but it's, it's underway. It's underway. So essentially your message is watch this space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, more and more can be revealed. Um, but it's something that I am actively engaged in. Yeah. And I live in Los Angeles. I live in the belly of the beast. So that's a helpful thing for me, um, to, to be connected to that kind of, uh, society. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I'm from Chicago and I'd like to think we're like a big media producing place, you know, we're mid-sized, but I imagine it's very handy to be out in LA where, everything is um but everything's moving around like you're you you know you meet with people and they're in all these everyone's in different cities now it doesn't all happen here so that's that's useful too that's true that's true i mean i was just speaking with a game creator who literally was in montreal and i was like oh look this is great i don't have to go to montreal to talk to you i can just do it from home so at the end of each podcast i ask every guest if they will either read if they're unfamiliar or recite if you're just you know that level of cool the shelley version of the poem ozymandias so i I, I, i'm to do a dramatic reading (laughs) please i mean i i (laughs) always enjoy dramatic readings okay here we go are we ready yes okay let's see how i do i'm gonna try to get my um audible voice going. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. So I am going to ask you now for Kara's hot takes because this poem is my favorite of all time. It's so evocative. It's just, I could go on. So I don't want to go on because my audience has heard me ramble on about it for far too many episodes now. So Um, it's everything. It's, uh, it's that we will all become ruins that every society we think will last forever will not that every king or leader even in the moment is constantly racing against his or her own eventual failure. Um, It's um, that human need to always be on top of a system that will never allow them to remain on top. Um, That all of us will be brought down, but the ones who will be brought down the lowest are those who think they cannot be brought down. So, um, but you can look at it of our whole conversation of the patriarchy and the water in which we swim changing into something else, you could see that not just as a kingship that then goes into an intermediate period and turns into another kingship, but you could see it instead as the kingship par excellence, the masculine rule that we have all been subsumed by for the last 10,000 years. But it's a reminder that it's only been 10,000 years. And where I sit now in Los Angeles, the land of the Tongva and Gabrielino people, it's only been a couple hundred years imposed upon them from the Spanish and then white settlers afterwards. So this this patriarchy in terms of the human lifespan is young and it's not going to last and it's time is over. And and so you, you could look at the poem from that perspective as well. And I just find it very interesting that Shelley wrote it about Ramesses II when I'm like, honestly, to me, this would have been way more fitting for Akhenaten, personally. Hmm. Um, Hmm. I don't know. There's something about anyone who knows me will tell you, like, I'm just obsessed with everything Akhenaten. And so I spend hours thinking about was this man certifiably insane or was he very sick? But so I think, you know, he should have 
it could be written about Akhenaten. But the, the last question I ask every guest, because I love the variety of answers I get, is if you think about the poem, if you think about who, what it's talking about, its messages to us now, is there something in modern society that we could say is a modern Ozymandias? You know, is there something that we think is like the be all end all greatest thing now that 2000 years from now, are we going to look back and be like, what the hell was that? Yeah, I think we're going through it in the United States right now. And I think it's this culture of individualism and this, this idea that we all get to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, that we uh, have only ourselves to blame if we are in poverty, that um, that we don't need anybody else. The Greeks are very much about this as well. He see its discussion that you don't need to rely on a neighbor. You need to do it all yourself because as soon as you ask a neighbor for a favor, they're just gonna, you're done. It's all this idea of individualism does find its roots in a Greco-Roman past of distrust and competition. And that competition and distrust has gotten us to um, my family in Texas um, living in six degree weather inside of their home because the oil companies are busy deregulating so they can make as much money off of people as they possibly can. And this rugged individualism, this ideology of an American patriotism, I think is quickly exposing itself before our eyes as being extraordinarily selfish and extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily destructive. And that we are now seeing with this pandemic um, with natural disasters, how connected we are to each other and how community building is not a bad word and that socialism is also not a bad word, <laughs> that feminism is not a bad word, right? That these, is this community connection is where I see society going. And um, those rugged individuals, they, they look mean, they look selfish, they look controlling and they are quickly being rejected. And I, I think that's what I would connect it to. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Uh, so thank you again so much for joining me. I was so excited to get your thoughts on so many of these great questions. So my pleasure. I had a great I had a great time. And you should know I have a chapter on Akhenaten in the forthcoming book. So I did some deep dives into the Akhenaten world. And, you know, everyone thinks about him over their career if they work in antiquity in any way. And so I put some of my ideas down on on paper and you can you can read. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. And quickly, where can people find you? Because I know a lot of people will probably want to go find you. Yeah. So I'm on I'm on all the socials. Um, I'm most active in posting articles on on Facebook, though I sometimes post them on Twitter. Twitter's not the medium for that. Twitter's the medium to be all pithy and, and clever, which I'm often not. I'm I'm unfortunately more of a Facebooker because I like to work through the writing of others and then build that conversation. Um, tends to be an older audience, but it's an audience of a lot of old white men who get really upset at my opinion. So it's a fun and entertaining space to visit because it can blow up. Like I just posted something about um, if we can't figure out whether Britney Spears had agency of her own, then how can we figure out if, if Nefertiti and Hatshepsut and Cleopatra had agency of their own and people got so pissed off. And I really enjoyed it. So you can find most of that kind of stuff on Facebook, but I'm also on the Twitter and um, I suck at Instagram, but every now and then I'll post something. Um, I'm just not, I don't want to post selfies and take pictures of myself. So I don't quite know what to do. And, um, and during the depths of the pandemic, I did a lot of Facebook, Instagram live videos, and I would like to get back to, to some of that. Um, it takes a lot out of me because I'm not an entertainer. I don't like though people go, oh yes, we would all find that hard to believe, but I don't like being in the spotlight. I'm an educator first. So, and I get a lot of pushback for some of those videos. So putting myself out there, I get, it makes me kind of nervous. So I can do it when I'm in that space, but when I'm overrun and writing and dealing with other things, the university it's hard for me. So let's see about this summer though. I have a feeling I could get back out into the Facebook live streaming space again and um, start to piss people off and push buttons. Um, and I post all of the podcasts. I do a lot of podcasts, my favorite medium because it's so relaxed and it's not, you know, it's just a conversation. I love the give and take of it. Um, I love the, I love not knowing the questions in advance. That's very fun for me. And, um, 
and I post every podcast I've ever done on my Squarespace page. So you can find all of my podcasts and go on a crazy podcast binge. <laughs> I don't think I would want to do that, but you could um, on, on my, my, my own personal page. So, yes. Great. Well, y'all know where to find her. Please go find her. She's had some pretty great interviews and stuff that I've seen as I scroll on my Facebook. So I could talk to you for a billion million hours, but unfortunately there are not enough hours in the day for that. But yeah. So thanks again for joining me though. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, and for the old Facebook videos, you can find those on my YouTube. See, I Ah. don't remember all the things that I want. So I have a YouTube thing where you can see all the old Facebook extravagances, but thank you so much, Lexi. It was super fun till we talk again. Today's episode has proudly been sponsored by SASA, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance. Are you interested in ancient civilizations? Want to learn more about the origins of Assassin's Creed? Obsessed with ancient Norse, Mesoamerican or Chinese mythology? Then join SASA, Save Ancient Studies Alliance, to remind the world the importance of ancient studies through fun events like archaeo gaming and book clubs. SASA is always looking for volunteers. Don't be shy, reach out and tell us why you love ancient studies. Visit www.saveancientstudies.org to learn more. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. 